All right, we'll take out your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11 through 20. Um, I'm giving a bit of a, a vision for the year going forward and, and from where we are as a fellowship going forward from here, how we should go forward, those kind of things. Uh, it's not necessarily a vision statement or, uh, you know, those mission statement, vision statements that are put out there. But I think as you start a new year at a church, you know, we need to come back to the basics. We always need to come back and focus on the things that are so important and, and what the Lord tells us. And the passage I'm looking at here today, it's a bit of a harsh one. And, and I don't mean it to come across to you in a harsh way. Uh, but uh, I think we always have to allow the Lord to convict us where conviction is necessary, where we need to be, you know, exhorted, where we need to be reprimanded a little bit sometimes. And, and only you know in your own heart what's going on with you and the Lord. But as we look at this here today, I, I think it really is for a congregation to examine themselves as a congregation to determine, are we coming together here to you know, really worship the Lord and act out the things that he has called us to do in his word? Or are we going through the, the motions of being uh, spiritual? You know, and that's always a question we have to ask ourselves. Are we just going through the motions or are we really serving the Lord and uh, faithfully carrying out the will of the Lord in our own lives and in the life of the church? And so I think this passage does a pretty good job of calling us to task on that note. And so, as you begin there in verse 11, it says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of the assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are, they are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my face from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and, and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, and we ask that you would convict each heart as we embark upon a new year, upon a new decade. Father, we, we want the sacrifices that we bring to you to be fruitful, not futile. And so, Father, we ask that you would just convict our hearts of whatever it is, Lord, that's going on in our life, whatever point of sin, whatever point of um, just not faithfully following after you and, and uh, whatever hypocrisies might be involved, whatever rebellion and disobedience we may have in our hearts, Lord, that you convict us of those things today. So that today, in the, as the new year begins, we may begin to offer to you the sacrifices of praise, the sacrifices of thanksgiving that are genuine. Father, that they would not be an abomination to you, but you would receive them uh, joyfully. Lord, that it would be uh, an aroma to you as it, as it rises to your nose. And we thank you, Lord, that we can come to this place of just crying out to you and asking for repentance and asking for, Lord, just a, a new start, a, a fresh slate to begin again. And uh, Lord, we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's a very powerful passage of Scripture <coughs> Excuse me, that we're looking at here today. 
um, the nation of Israel at this point, uh, as we talked about warming up to uh, Christmas time, you know, it has is, is really come a long way since King David. Uh, King David and Solomon, they established this great kingdom there, and the Lord was using them mightily. Uh, but, you know, as time has gone on, kings have come along who have, who have led the people into idolatry and led the people into all kinds of sin. And the northern part of Israel has now been disbanded and taken into captivity up to Assyria. Uh, the southern kingdom is in danger of being taken into captivity to Babylon, and they eventually will be. And so God sends this amazing prophet, Isaiah, to rebuke them, to tell them, you need to repent or you will be judged. And that's what we see here is a nation who is coming to the Lord and they're acting, oh, praise you, Lord, you know, and they're going through the motions of doing the feasts and offering the offerings that they're supposed to offer and offering the incense and, and doing all the religious uh, activities that they've been called to do. But God knows in their hearts that their hearts are not for him. Their hearts are rebellious. Their hearts are still steeped in the sin for which they will be eventually judged. And so, you know, it's a, it's a great thing, I think, to see the Lord just see through all of that. He can see right through it. <laughs> Do you know that? That, you know, when we act out our spiritual lives, he knows when it's genuine and he knows when it is false. He knows when we are just going through the motions, when we have hypocrisy in our hearts. We're, we're raising our hands and we're saying the right things and doing the right things on the outside on Sunday morning. But deep within, God knows our hearts are far from him. And, and it's freeing to me that the Lord knows this, you know, that it's not even worthy of my attempt to try to trick him and to fool him. But yet we do. We do try to do that, don't we? We try to fool the Lord. He can't be fooled. And as we think about this here today, I was thinking about this idea of sacrifices. The ultimate sacrifice is for you to lay down your life, for you to put your life on that altar and to put away all the sin, all the garbage, all the things that make you feel good and, and just say, Lord, here I am. I am a living sacrifice to serve for you. And so as we think about that idea of sacrifice, back when the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776, those men that signed that, 56 of them, went into that room, and, and actually it was signed at different places, but we see this very famous painting of them all being the same room. Uh, over the course of time, it was signed in different places. But beyond that, the whole idea of them saying, I declare my independence from this nation of England that is, is sovereign, a nation that is trying to force me to do things that I don't want to do. And when they made that declaration and signed their names to that, they really, many of them signed a death certificate. They signed saying, you know, please come and persecute me. Please come and take all my belongings. Please come and, and destroy my life. Because that's indeed what happened to them, many of them. If you look at those 56 men, five were captured by the British and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary War. Another had two sons captured. Nine fought and died from wounds of, or hardship of the war. A wealthy planter and trader saw his ship sunk by the British Navy and died in poverty. At the Battle of Yorktown, the British uh, General Cornwallis had taken over Thomas Nelson's home for his headquarters. Nelson quietly ordered General George Washington open fire on the Nelson home and it was destroyed. And then Nelson himself died in bankruptcy. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. His fields and mill were destroyed. For over a year, he lived in a forest and caves, returning home only to find his wife dead and his children vanished. A few weeks later, he died from exhaustion. And you see the toll that that sacrifice took on their lives. 
I declare my independence. And I wonder if they knew what, exactly what they were getting themselves into. The children of Israel made a covenant with the Lord. And they said, we will do what you tell us to do, Lord. As you see there, King David in, in 1 Chronicles 21, he realized the value of a sacrifice to the Lord. It has to cost, cost me something, he said. As, as a man was going to give him a threshing floor and, and some, some cattle to offer as offerings to the Lord, he was saying, here, King David, take these things and offer them to the Lord. I'll give them to you freely. And King David said, no, but I will surely buy it for the full price. For I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings with that which costs me nothing. And I think we see within that the value of a sacrifice, the value of making a commitment to the Lord. It's got to cost me something or it's worth nothing ultimately to the Lord. And it's worth nothing to me. The children of Israel, again, they, they have made this agreement with the Lord. They have said to the Lord, uh, all the things you have told us, we will do. All the, uh, the, the laws, the Ten Commandments, all these things that you've asked us to do, we will do them. But they were not really willing to walk that out. They weren't willing to see that the sacrifices that the Lord required for a sinful life or for sins they committed or for having a closer communion with the Lord really was themselves being put upon that altar themselves. As we see in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable for us because of what God has done for us in the New Testament sense of Jesus coming and laying down his life so that we may have eternal life. It is only reasonable for us now to take our lives and to put them on that altar as a living sacrifice and to live out our lives for him. But so often that sacrifice that we say that we're making with our mouths that sacrifice climbed off that altar a long time ago and ran off. We're just still pretending it's up there. We're still pretending that we're actually serving the Lord faithfully. We're still pretending that there's a real sacrifice going on in our lives, but in actuality, it's not costing us anything oftentimes. It's not costing us anything. We're getting everything we want out of life and everything we want out of this spiritual experience of being in a church and having good friends and, and uh, you know, the joy of coming together and singing songs together and hearing interesting sermons being preached sometimes. You know, we're, we're kind of, we, we enjoy that aspect of it. But when it comes to walking out that door and laying down on my life and allowing the Lord to use me, we're not willing to take it to that extent. And so often our lives outside the walls of the church don't reflect what we're saying with our mouth is my life is on that altar. I'm serving the Lord as a living sacrifice. Are we walking that out and actually serving the Lord in that way? Well, of course, all of this has been set forth in types and shadows from the Old Testament as God told the children of Israel to, to develop this system of sacrifice. Through the Levitical priesthood, they were to build an altar and build all these instruments and, and, uh, and this basin to wash in. And all these things were told to them. Uh, build the Ark of the Covenant, build this tabernacle of meeting, and, and the priests will run this system of sacrifice substitutionary sacrifice, taking a lamb, taking a ram, taking a bull, taking birds and all these animals that they would sacrifice in this system for various reasons uh, for the sins of man and for us to have a closer communion with the Lord. Animals would pay the price and their blood would be shed so that we may have that closer relationship with the Lord. Exodus 24, 5 says, then he sent young men of the children of Israel, the Lord did, who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. 
Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to, in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. And so when we think about this idea of sacrifice, it's all pointing back to this first covenant that the Lord made with the children of Israel. This idea of substitutionary uh, death. An animal is going to shed its blood so that your sins may be covered. That you won't be seen as being guilty before the Lord. And the people said, absolutely, we will do that. We will do all that you have said and will be obedient to do those things. But now, fast forward, I don't know, I think we're about a thousand years into the future from that point, and maybe even 2,000 years. And the people are only keeping half of that bargain. We'll go, we'll do the sacrifices, we'll walk through the motions, but we won't be obedient. And that is what the Lord is about to judge them for. That is the reason that they will be disbanded and taken into captivity in Babylon, because they're only willing to do half. I'm only willing to do the exterior spiritual calisthenics to make everybody else think I'm still walking with the Lord, but my heart is far from him. And as we think about this here today, going into this new year, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what kind of sin you might have, what kind of hidden sin, what kind of uh, things that you're doing that nobody else knows. Only you and the Lord know about it. But I'm willing to believe that all of us have areas of our lives that aren't surrendered to him. All of us have areas that we need to repent of. All of us have areas that we need to, uh, you know, just surrender to the Lord in, in repentance. So that we may say with our mouth and with our heart the same thing. I love the Lord. I appreciate what he has done for me. And I'm going to surrender my life to him as a living sacrifice to live for him for the rest of my life. And that is what he has asked us to do now. It's what he asked the people to do back then. And it's what he's always asked from us is that we would make that ultimate sacrifice just as he did when he sent his son down to this earth. And so what are suitable sacrifices, I guess, is, is what we want to look at here today. Certainly the Lord says there are futile sacrifices. What you're doing is a waste of time. I hate what you're doing. It's not getting through it. You're not getting any points from me. All that stuff you're doing, I can see right through it. I know that your heart is not there. It's just ritual that you're carrying on. But he also says, but there are things you can be doing that will bring forth fruit that are acceptable in my eyes. And so we want to look at that here today just as a um, as just a message on Sunday morning, but also apply that to the next year, to the next decade of your life. How can you serve the Lord in a way that is not futile, but in a way that is fruitful? Amen? Amen. And so as we look at this here, going back over the verses, he says, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? And that's a pretty good question, I think. What is the purpose of us being here right now? You ever thought about that? Why do we come here on Sunday morning? Is it so I can hang out with my friends? Is it so I can hear some great music from Russ and, and the Rustolians, or what are we calling ourselves now? The, the Rustifers? Rustolians. <laughs> Why are we here? What is the purpose of this sacrifice that we make? to get out of bed early on a Sunday morning. Wouldn't it be nice just to sleep in on Sunday mornings? I know some of you do that still sometimes when we don't see you here. Oh, okay, they're sleeping in. No. What is the purpose though? Why do we sacrifice the way we do? Why do we take money out of our bank accounts and, and send it off to this church? Why do I come here three hours before other people get here to serve in certain ministries? Why do I stay two hours after to, to do other things? Why do I work at my house on projects 
to bring back down here to this building? Why do I sacrifice? Why do I lay down my life and lay down certain privileges in my life? What's the purpose of it? And is it bringing forth fruit? Is it, is it futile or is there actually something that's, that's being uh, accounted to me as righteousness? Accounted to me as, as fruit, as being of value to the Lord of the universe, to our Heavenly Father. Why am I doing what I'm doing? To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? And I think that's a, a key phrase that you'll see on throughout this passage is the Lord says, you, you're praying a lot. <laughs> you're bringing a lot of sacrifices. And, and there's the key there. It's just, I'm going through the motions. The more I pray, the more I bring my sacrifice, you know, it, it, it comes across as work to the Lord. It's not a, a real true um, relationship that I have with the Lord. It's, I have a lacking relationship with the Lord. Therefore, I need to make up with doing more spiritual stuff. And of course, we get into that rut, don't we, from time to time. If, if I can just do more for the Lord, he'll, he'll overlook some of that other stuff. Some of these other areas of my life, he'll, he'll overlook those and he'll forgive me for those because I'm working real hard for the Lord, you know. I'm bringing a multitude of sacrifices to the Lord. Surely he will have to overlook the other things. But that is not at all the biblical understanding. The biblical understanding is I have that right heart with the Lord and, and all the other things can be overlooked. All the other weaknesses can be overlooked. Love covers a multitude of sins, the Bible says. The Lord says, what is the purpose of all this stuff you're bringing to me? Because I know it's not genuine. I know that you're out there involved in sin. You're out there worshiping other idols, the Lord says. And if you go back, and we don't have time to do it today, you read the, the first 10 verses of this chapter, you see what the Lord is talking about. Is he goes in great detail about their sin. And he describes the people as being bruised and, and wounded and putrefying sores on their bodies that haven't been cleaned and bandaged. They're in terrible condition. And yet they're coming to the Lord and professing that everything's okay. And the Lord said, no, it's not. It's not okay. I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams, he says, and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. Yes, those things were set up as a means for your sins to be covered and so that you won't stand before the Lord with sin accounted to you. But that's not the Lord's heart. The Lord is, to, his heart is to have a, a clean relationship with you where you're not coming constantly to ask for forgiveness for doing things that you shouldn't be doing. He says, just be obedient. That's, that's what I want from you. Obedience. 1 Samuel 15, 22. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? As Saul came to uh, Samuel and he had all these goats and lambs and all this, these animals behind him from the, the victory that he just won. But the Lord had told him to go wipe everything out. Don't keep anything. Don't keep anything. Just kill it all. The Lord has demanded that everything be sacrificed. And uh, Saul comes back with all that stuff. Hey, I did everything you, the Lord told me to do. And Sammy says, really? Why do I hear lambs in the background then? Why do I hear these animals in the background? You haven't done what the Lord asked you to do. Oh, but we're going to offer those as sacrifices to the Lord. <laughs> yeah, that's a, the, the guys, you know, they wanted to have these animals that they could offer to the Lord. Has the Lord great delight in burnt offerings? Is that what he wants? Or does he want obedience? And he makes it very clear there. Obeying the voice of the Lord is far more valuable than offering sacrifices because you didn't obey the voice of the Lord, right? Behold, to obey is better 
than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as iniquity and harlotry. That is so powerful. Rebellion, it's like witchcraft. It's like you're out there practicing witchcraft. You might as well be in the Lord's eyes. That's what rebellion is to the Lord. And so I've been, I've been involved in witchcraft, and yet, here, forgive me for being involved in witchcraft. I'm not going to repent of it, but, you know, let me, let me just do this little spiritual ritual to, to allow me to keep on doing it, is kind of the idea. And so as we look at this together, what does he say next? I don't delight in that stuff. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? You're just coming in here doing whatever you want to do. You just, hey, I'll worship God any way I want to. I know he's prescribed certain ways of doing it, but I'm just going to come in here and do my thing just to get it done with and then go back and do my thing again. To trample my courts. Who's, who's required this from you? Did I tell you to trample my courts like this? To disobey me like this? No, absolutely not. Bring no more futile sacrifices, incense. It's an abomination to me. God says, I've had enough. I'm up to here with your burnt offerings. You're not fooling me. If, that, if it was genuine, then yes, I would forgive. I would hear you. But it just, it comes across as an abomination to the Lord. And again, I, I think that should be freeing for us to understand. We can't fool him. We can't trick him into forgiving us. It just doesn't work that way. The Lord knows all. So he goes on there. <clears throat> he says, the new moons, the Sabbaths, the, the calling of assemblies. I can't endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. The two things together. You know, the Lord set up these sacred meetings, these, the Passover and the, the Feast of Tabernacles and, and all these great feasts that he set up as a means of the people coming together and worshiping the Lord together and recognizing certain things that the Lord has done for them. He set up all these sacred meetings, these, these feasts, but the people are coming in with filthy hearts and uh, unrepentant hearts. The Lord said, I can't endure that. I can't deal with that. And that's why as we take communion, you know, I, I love that idea that we put out this morning, you know, the joy. With joy, we come before the Lord. And with joy, the Lord receives us and brings us together in this holy communion together. And, and, and to have that, you know, precious presence of the Lord as we commune together with him, it's so wonderful. But the Lord says, I can't handle it. I can't, I, I can't deal with it. You're, you weary me with these things because you have iniquity that you're bringing into that sacred ceremony. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. And again, you know, to bring it into the 21st century, you have to ask yourself now, what am I doing that wearies the Lord? What kind of spiritual calisthenics do I do when I know darn well that I'm doing other things that are filled with iniquity on the side that I haven't repented of? That I just keep doing and just expecting the Lord to forgive me and keep doing it, expect the Lord to forgive me. Hear what the Lord is saying to that kind of a heart. It wearies me, he says. My soul hates it. It's a trouble to me that we come with a hypocrisy and expect the Lord just to overlook that stuff. Just to wink at it. Not give you a nod. Yeah, well, me and the guy upstairs, you know, we got this agreement. You know, you hear people say things like that. No, you don't. You don't. He makes the agreements. You just agree to them. And he doesn't make those kind of agreements. And his soul is troubled, is wearied by our constant hypocrisy. He says, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make my prayers, or even though you make many prayers, again, this idea of it's a multitude of things I'm doing. I'm not just praying once, I'm praying a lot. I'm, I'm sacrificing a lot. 
to try to, you know, make it look more spiritual. I won't hear it, he says. Your hands are full of blood. And I think about that, you know, in, in the charismatic circles I've traveled in over the years. And, you know, I, I just, I mentioned it here before, you know, the outward show is a big deal in the charismatic circles. You know, it's the, the raising of the hands and the, um, not necessarily drawing attention to themselves, but sometimes that happens. But it's a very outward, outward show of, of affection to the Lord, outward show of worship to the Lord. And yet as I traveled in those circles, I found that some of those people were the most carnal Christians I had ever been around in my whole Christian experience, you know. And seeing them, knowing how carnal they were, seeing them on Sunday morning, oh, you know, they're doing their thing. And it's like, whoa, wow. And, and I just think about this verse here. You spread out your hands to me, I'll hide my eyes from you. I don't see it. I won't hear you. You make your prayers, but I won't hear them. You got blood on your hands. Imagine that, standing there worshiping the Lord, and you've got blood on your hands. And the, the idea of blood is just the sin. The sin of those animals that were sacrificed for your forgiveness, and yet you trash that blood. You, you, you don't recognize the significance of that blood. And now we're talking about this, the blood of animals, but think about the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is what makes you clean, what makes you right with the Lord. Think about standing there with his blood on your hands. I claim to know Jesus. I claim to surrender my life to him, and yet I live a sinful life. I disrespect his blood. That's pretty heavy. That is pretty heavy. And so you could see the heart of the Lord, why he's so grieved by this, why it pains him so much, and, and why it pains him still today that we um, have such a cheap grace kind of a system of Christianity sometimes. Um, hey, I've got grace. I can do whatever I want to do, right? God's poured out his grace. He'll forgive me. You know, I can go out and live whatever kind of life I want to. Paul said, no. No. <laughs> Far be it. No. God forbid. You can't do that. Hey, if, if I get more grace when I sin, that means I should sin more. No. Absolutely not. No. God forbid that you trash the sacrifice that Jesus has made for you and, and value it so little that you would just hypocrisy, uh, hypocritically go out and do whatever you want to do, knowing that his blood will it is a covering for all sin and so futile sins futile sins what are they i just broke it down a little bit here you could probably find a few more if you really dug through there but i think again quantity and not quality the more i do the more lord will see it and and he'll forgive me you know it's kind of the idea just do lots of stuff do lots of spiritual stuff and god will see it and oh, okay He's good. All right, she's serving me a lot. Well, I'll overlook the other things. No. What is the quality of the sacrifice that you're offering to the Lord? Not quantity. Jesus talked about the priests in his day that were going around praying these long prayers, standing on the street corner in you know, flowing robes and this whole spiritual thing. You know, look how spiritual I am. Jesus says, no, he knows what you need before you even ask him. You don't have to pray these long prayers. That's what the heathen do. You don't have to do that, Jesus said. It's not the quantity. It's the quality. It's what's coming from your heart. You remember the, the, the little widow who came and offered her two mites? And Jesus said, she gave more than everybody. She gave the least amount of money, but she gave it from her lack, where everybody else gave it from their abundance. She gave the most in God's eyes, her offering, her sacrifice was the greatest sacrifice. It wasn't futile. Ritual, not reverence, I think is, is something you definitely see in these verses. There's just a ritualistic thing going on, not an actual reverence for the Lord and the blood that is being shed for their sins. Observance, not obedience. Uh, God says, hey, just be obedient. 
I don't want you to observe all these other things necessarily. They're there for you uh, to, to give you that, that atonement when you do fall. But ultimately, obedience is what the Lord wants, not observance of rituals. Hypocrisy, not humility. And it does take a lot of humility for us to come to this place of recognizing our failings, recognizing our weaknesses, recognizing that, that we don't have it all, you know, as much as we like to portray to the world how spiritual we are. It takes humility to realize I'm not nearly as spiritual as I need to be. I'm not nearly as humble and broken as I should be. And anything else that I do to portray that out to people, it's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy. And so I think this is a great call for us at the beginning of the year here, just to get off on the right foot with the Lord as we serve him here in this church. And then obviously sin is going on in the camp, not sincerity. Now, the last couple of verses there, verse 16, he says, well, here's what you do about that then. I love how he breaks this down. Here's what's going on. How then shall we live, right, Mike? What should we do about that? Hey, repent. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Now, people have set this up as a formula. Okay, this stuff we're supposed to be doing, you know. This is just examples, obviously. These are the good things that God has said in his word that he wants to see from us. These are the things that show that we really have a heart for laying down our lives and serving others rather than just serving ourselves. And so obviously these are, these are great things to be doing, but uh, I think there's probably a thousand more things to add to that list. These are just great examples. But certainly the idea of, of learning to do good and rebuking the evil or, or not doing the evil caring for the needs of people rather than just ourselves. That was the heart of John the Baptist as he came out and he said to the people, Luke 3, 8, bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Again, there's this, the, the spiritual rituals that, it, that are being spoken about there, right? Hey, we're, we're children of Abraham, you know, look at us, we're the Israelites and we can do no wrong is kind of the, the heart they had. And they looked down on everybody else in the world just because they felt they were the children of Israel or the children of Abraham and, and they could do no wrong. Jesus says, hey, I can raise up rocks <laughs> to, the, to become children of Abraham. You know, the real true Israelite, Paul said, is the one that's inwardly an Israelite. Just because you come from a certain family line doesn't mean that you're right with the Lord. God doesn't have any grandchildren or great-grandchildren, right? Only children. And so he goes on there. I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And so here's the line. So the people asked him, saying, what do we do then? He answered and said to them, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. He who has food, let him do likewise. And so the cry of the people, what do we do? Our hearts are convicted. We realize we're in sin. We're not doing what we're supposed to do. What should we do? Wash yourselves. Repent. Do good. Go away from the evil and learn to do the good. And, of course, you look at that idea of the tree. The ax is laid to the root of the tree that is not fruitful. It's chopped down. It's thrown into the fire. It's not bearing any good fruit. And so what good is it? And the obvious connection there is what good is a Christian that proclaims with their mouth that they're a believer in Jesus Christ, but they do no good? They do no good. They don't live it out. They don't sacrifice their own life so that others can be blessed by it. It goes right along with what he said as he quoted from the Ten Commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's interesting as I reached out to the pastoral council this week and I just said, hey, what are you guys hearing from the Lord? 
because um, I want to hear what you guys are hearing from the Lord because of this message that I'm giving this Sunday. And it was great that a couple of them wrote back and, and one of them was, you know, this verse right here, love your neighbor as yourself. How can we take this message out to the people out there in this lost and dying world? Love your neighbor as yourself. How then shall we live? How then shall we, as we are convicted by this, as we are convicted by the fact that maybe we're just going through the motions a little bit, and I'm not saying that across the board, but certainly uh, as a church, we have to ask that question. Are we just going through the motions? Are we just doing the spiritual calisthenics to make us feel good about ourselves, but we're not actually taking it out to the community? And those are the, the things that we're going to be dealing with. That's why this council has is, is come on board, and they're going to be trying to figure out ways. How can we do that? How can we go out and defend the defenseless? How can we go out and, and provide justice for those who don't have it? How can we go out and, and share with people the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they can be set free from the oppression that they're in? And so those are the things that we're going to be looking at as we go forward this year for this church. Uh, I'm excited about it. I know we're a small church, but there's no reason we can't be effective. There's no reason we can't be fruitful, but we can't be fruitful. I guess there is one reason we couldn't be fruitful, is if we, often, if we offer futile sacrifices to the Lord. If we offer fruitful sacrifices to the Lord, we will be fruitful. And so that's why he says to the people, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. It's interesting what he's saying when he says, let's reason together. He's pointing back to the beginning of the chapter. And again, we don't have time to go back into that, but the idea of animals knowing where they get their food from. I remember living up in Wyoming uh, out on our ranch uh, back in the 80s, early 80s. And we had cows and pigs and horses and chickens and, you know, all that stuff. And it was great, and I absolutely loved it. And uh, that's why I live where I live now, although I don't have time for that now. <laughs> but anyway, um, we had these pigs that uh, they just, you couldn't keep them corralled. I mean, we rebuilt their pen about a thousand times. And, and every morning we'd wake up and the pigs would be sleeping with the cows out in the field or in the barn. They just liked hanging out with the cows. I don't know why. They just did. And the cows didn't seem to mind either. And so they were all just a little happy team out there. But we would feed the cows and then we'd go down to the pig pen and feed the pigs. And the pigs knew that's where I get my food from. And they would run down there. And uh, it was a great piece of property that went out. And then there was a, a drop off down into a ravine and a little creek down there. And then the pig pen was on the other side of that creek. It's just a beautiful piece of property. And uh, so we'd go down there and the pigs would follow us down because they knew, hey, this is where I get my food from. And what the Lord is saying to the children here or, or to the nation of Israel he says in the, in the beginning of the chapter there, I, I gave birth to this nation, but, but they don't come to me. They don't come to me. You know, dumb beasts know where to get their food from, but my children, for some reason, they, they can't figure it out. They don't know where to get their food from. They don't know where to get their abundance from. Stupid animals can figure it out, but they can't. And so that's why he's saying here, come now, let us reason together. The Lord is a reasonable, you know, he wants to reason with us. Your sins right now, they're like scarlet. You got a lot of blood on your hands is the idea. But it can become white as snow. If you just realize who you need to come to, I will forgive you of your sins. They're red as crimson right now, but they will be as wool. And so come to this place of repentance to the Lord. And that's the last thing I want to close with here. Um, if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat of the fruit of the land, he says. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. 
So if you're willing, if you're obedient, if you come to the Lord and you repent of your sins, he'll wash them away, just as he does today. And so I want to call us into a time of repentance here this morning. And I want you to be thinking about these things. If you refuse and rebel, hey, you're going to be devoured. But if you come and if you're willing to be, uh, allow the Lord to change you, allow him to uh, work in your life, be obedient to him, you'll eat of the good spiritually. And so the last thing we look at here, these fruitful sacrifices, what are they? Well, obviously purity, holiness, righteousness, that is what he's called us to as believers in Jesus Christ. He's called us to do good works. He's called us, and then those things don't, uh, that doesn't mean we're trying to work for our salvation. Obviously, he's called us through grace. We've accepted, and now he says, now go out and live a life that is filled with good works, with righteousness, with holiness, with purity. He's called us to do justice, to defend the defenseless. He's called us to repentance and to obedience. And so I want to just take a few moments here this morning for you to say, all right, Lord, we're starting a new year here. And maybe you've already done this. And if you have, praise the Lord. But let's do it again here today. So take a few minutes as Russ maybe comes up and, and plays uh, quietly on his guitar. Take a few minutes to say, Lord, I want all this evil out of my life. I repent of my sins. I want to have a right relationship with you. I want to know that I'm not just going through the motions with you. I want to know that I'm not just putting on some kind of spiritual air here. I want my heart right with the Lord. I don't want you to reject my offerings. And so Lord, convict me about what is right, what is holy, what is pure before your eyes. And Lord, show me how I can do the good works. Show me how I can defend the defenseless and bring justice. Lord, bring me into a place of repentance and obedience to you, I pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your truth. Lord, even though these words were written 2,700 years ago, Lord, we know that they are still just as valid today because we are human beings. And you know us so well. You know that we can put on a spiritual front that fools everybody. But we're really not fooling you. And so, Father, we come today, the beginning of a new year, the beginning of a new decade, Lord. We want to come into a place of repentance and obedience to you. Lord, we don't want to just do rituals. We want to be right with you. Lord, we don't want to just have observances of our faith. We want to have obedience to the faith. And so, Father, we come today, each heart crying out to you for repentance. Each heart crying out to be right with you as the year unfolds. Lord, that the incense we bring, the sacrifices that we bring, they will be a sweet-smelling aroma to your nose, not a putrefying abomination. Father, make us right before you. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our waywardness, our weakness to be inclined to the things of the world and not to the things of you. Lord, we praise you for these things here today. Now just take a few moments to speak to the Lord individually.
Father God, we commit all these things to you today with a heart that is pure, with a heart that is sincere. Lord, get us off to the right start this year, this decade, Lord, as we want to see your will be accomplished in our own hearts and our own lives and in this church. Lord, we have a sense that you're moving here, that you're bringing people that want to serve you. Lord, you're putting the pieces into place to do a move. But we want to see it. We want to be a part of it. But Father, we know that if our hearts are not right before you, you will not use us. You will not use an unclean vessel. So Father, all of us today cry out to you, cleanse us, wash us, prepare us. For your glory, for your kingdom, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.